Hello, and welcome to Other Voices, brought to you by Peninsula Peace and Justice Center. I'm your host, Paul George. This month marks the 150th, 150th anniversary of the birth of Mohandas Gandhi, a revered civil and human rights activist known for his development of the use of nonviolence in those struggles. His principles inspired and informed the struggles of our own revered civil and human rights leader, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. To commemorate this occasion, Stanford University's Martin Luther King Jr. Institute will be hosting the Gandhi King Global Initiative, a three-day gathering to launch an international network of institutions, organizations, and activists committed to the nonviolent struggle for human rights. On this month's Other Voices, we'll learn about the histories of these two remarkable leaders, how they are connected, the meaning of nonviolence, and, of course, we'll get details on the conference, which takes place October 11th through the 13th at Stanford University. And joining me to help with this discussion, I'm really pleased to welcome back to Other Voices, Dr. Claiborne Carson, the Executive Director of the King Institute and a Professor of History at Stanford University. Selected in 19, 1985 by Mrs. Coretta Scott King to edit and publish the papers of her late husband, Dr. Carson has devoted most of his professional life to the study of Martin Luther King, Jr. and the movements King inspired. Under Carson's direction, the King Papers Project has produced seven volumes of Dr. King's speeches, sermons, correspondence, publications, and unpublished writings. In 2005, the King Papers Project became part of the Martin Luther King, Jr. Research and Education Institute at Stanford University with Dr. Carson serving as its founding director. Welcome back to Other Voices. Good to be here. Great to have you here. And um, before I get into <clears throat> what sounds like a really exciting conference, I mean, just looking at the list of speakers and, and, and your plans, I, I'd like to get into some history for folks, because I think it's sure. good, and especially on the 150th anniversary, to remind ourselves of why and how these two leaders had such a, a great impact. And so let's, let's start with Mohandas Gandhi um, and how he came to develop this system of nonviolent protest in the face first of apartheid South Africa and then at home in occupied India where he was born and raised. How did he come upon it? What well, it's a fascinating him? story and it really starts um, 100 years ago, um, more than 100 years ago, uh, when he was... Uh, thrown off a train for riding in the first class compartment and uh, he um, he was in South Africa in South okay. Africa and he uh, decided to respond to this by trying to organize uh, initially uh, fairly conservative uh, in his outlook and in, in the sense that he was asserting his right as a British subject uh -huh. and he felt that he should not be treated this way and and that uh, so he he thought in terms of the law. He had gone to uh, to um, England to be trained as a lawyer. He was serving there as a and, lawyer. And uh, he, um, but then he on, took on the task of trying to represent the interests of the uh, Indian community in South Africa, which was rather large, as in many places. I mean, one of the ironies of history is that as slavery was overcome, the need for labor throughout the world led to uh, the use of Indian labor, enormous supply of labor, uh -huh. uh, sometimes indentured, sometimes not, but, uh, but throughout the Caribbean, throughout uh, many parts of the world, uh, Indian labor replaced slave labor as one of the primary, more flexible sources of labor that could go where the need was in terms of this expanding world economy. And, and work cheaply. <laughs> and work cheaply, yeah. yes. And, and just a reminder, in apartheid South Africa, then and up until apartheid was overcome, it wasn't just black Africans that were uh, discriminated against, but all people of color. Yes, yeah, so, although different levels. You yeah. know, uh, one of the things about Gandhi initially is that uh, even, even in jail, he kind of thought that he should be treated differently from from black uh, South Africans um, because they were uh, at a, a lower level of development and 
You know, so there, I, you know, when you look at, at Gandhi, you see someone who develops over time. Over time, yeah. And, and moves beyond his uh, more provincial attitudes and, and gradually become the, the Gandhi that we know something about. Now, his protests in South Africa, what form did they take? Did he develop his system of nonviolent protests there? He really developed the idea there. And uh, some of it had to do with simply refusing to um, accept the rules. Uh, and I mean, one, one of the basic notions uh, of Gandhi is that oppression exists when we allow it to oppress us. Uh -huh. You know, if, if you are willing to do almost anything to avoid repression, that's resistance. And uh, what you have to do is, is think of what is the most effective way. And uh, doing it nonviolently is probably the most effective because obviously if you had the power to overcome your oppressor, you wouldn't be oppressed. That's right. <laughs> so, uh, so it's a recognition that the only power you have is the power to say no. And if you do that with enough firmness and hopefully with enough numbers, uh, you can gradually overcome your oppressor. You know, oppression depends on um, acquiescence. And how would you characterize his success or lack of it in, in South Africa? Um, moderately successful, but enough success to get attention in, in India. Yeah. Yes, and, and as a result of that, he writes his first um, um, book. And, uh, While he was still know, in South Africa. So by the time he's, what, uh, what is 50 years old? I mean, when most people are, are thinking of, you know, what to do with the rest of your life, uh -huh. you know, he really starts his, the rest of his life. Yeah, and, and that's and when he returned to India? That's when he returns to India in, uh, I think, 1919, around there. And uh, by that time, he is well known in India. And of course, the Indian independence movement has its own history, which starts back in the 19th century. Um, you know, and by yeah, I think pe a lot of people aren't clear that he didn't start that oh, movement. Oh, no, not he, at all. He there, went there, was home a, and, there was a movement already, a thriving movement, uh, that was uh, welcoming a, a leader who would already achieve some success. And um, uh, so when he came in, he already had a reputation. Uh, he uh, came into a situation where there was al already a great deal of resistance, and it, and it needed a, a leader who would give some guidance to it. And what were some of his first actions when he returned to India? Well, it took him a while to get to really get going. Uh, another. You know, his life is kind of remarkable. Uh, even, even by age 60, you know, there wasn't too much to show uh -huh. because uh, he had not really uh, succeeded in, in really bringing about any, any significant changes. Hadn't um, attracted large a lot numbers. Of, a lot of the this. campaigns he led had um, only modest success. Uh, you know, there was the massacre, which those of you who have seen the, the film know about, uh, where uh, Indian protesters are, are massacred by the British Army. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, it sets back the movement, obviously. It, it's, it was a, and, and this is in the 1930s, so even at that stage, uh, there was some sense that, well, you know, this, this is going to be a long struggle. Right. They're up against very powerful occupying I, forces. I mean, it, it's interesting to kind of compare him with King, whose active career is amazingly short. Yes. And um, started much younger. About, about a dozen years. Yeah. And, uh, and a lot happens. And again, kind of like the case with Gandhi, we can't understand King except by saying, he didn't start this. Uh, he came in to a movement that was already well developed. You know, Rosa Parks was already an experienced civil rights leader right. before she met Martin Luther King. So um, it's it's uh, 
fortunate for him, because he only lived a short life, 39 years, you know, if we compare where Gandhi was at 39 years old, we wouldn't be talking about him today. Yeah. Um, but That's King true. came into a movement that was already uh, matured. Uh, the NAACP had been around for a long time, for a long time yeah. almost 50 years. And, and uh, so he had that institutional framework to, to build upon. And well, let's, let's turn our attention to Dr. King then. How did he end up getting um, so taken by Gandhi's um, concepts of, of nonviolent struggle? Well, one of the things we'll have at the conference is a, is a display, which I call African-American Gandhians. Uh -huh. And uh, you, know, you, you look at that history, and almost from the beginning, of uh, Gandhi's return to India, black newspapers in the United States pick it up and begin to publish articles about what Gandhi is doing in India, um, their uh, Du Bois in the crisis um, writes articles about Gandhi, Howard Thurman. Um, I hope some of you know Howard Thurman, who was a San Francisco minister for, for many years. His church is still, still in San Francisco. Which church? Um, church of All Faiths. Uh, I think that's still the name of it. Uh, uh, and it was one of the f very first, in the 1940s, one of the very first churches that was interracial. I mean, you think of that, that there had never really been uh, any kind of well-established church that was truly interracial. So, uh, but before that, in 1936, Thurman goes to India with Sue Bailey Thurman. And I, I never knew Howard Thurman, but Sue Bailey Thurman once came to the King Papers Project at Stanford, and I got a chance to meet her. And I met other members of his family. But he was this uh, phenomenal um, theologian, minister, um, very, he wrote a book, um, a very influential book, on, on uh, um, black theology, uh, pedagogy of the oppressed, uh, just a, a book that I would recommend you read now uh, because it, it, it really does place Christianity in a different framework. And that book influenced lots of other people when he came back. Uh, and he was only one of many, uh, you know, these African-American Gandhians who went to India uh, Benjamin Mays, who becomes King's uh, mentor at uh, Morehouse College. Uh, um, James Farmer, uh, one of the founders of the Congress of Racial Equality. Mm -hmm. um, uh, James Lawson, who will be at the conference uh, next weekend, uh, went to India in the early 1950s. And, you know, Gandhi had already been assassinated, but he um, was able to study with, with Gandhians and came back with all this enthusiasm and went to Martin Luther King and, and Martin Luther King said, look, you, you've got to come to the South. You've got to, uh, you know, really, um, there's a movement going here. And he uh, uh, was a minister who, uh, he, he had been a missionary actually in, 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 in India, but he comes back and goes to Vanderbilt and becomes a divinity student and starts a workshop in Nashville. And out of that workshop come many of the leaders of the black struggle of the 60s, Diane Nash, John Lewis, who is now Congressman John Lewis, uh, Bernard Lafayette, who will be at the conference uh, next, next week. Uh, um, many of these people come out of that workshop and James Bevel, you know, another person who comes out of that, and, um, become very influential uh, people in the subsequent uh, student movement uh, of the 1960s. Uh, the people who formed the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC. Um, the people who lead the sit-ins in 1960, the Freedom Rise in 1961, uh, who go into the South, you know, and the Freedom Rides go into Jackson, Mississippi, and. Uh, many of those students decide to drop out of school and, and uh, become full-time civil rights workers. 
So all of this is, is kind of a stream that comes from taking Gandhian ideas and adapting them uh, to the, you know, the background in, in the United States. I mean, there, you know, when you think about a tactic like the sit-in, it's of course influenced by Gandhian ideas and mm -hmm. nonviolence and all of that, but it's also influenced by the sit-down strikes mm -hmm. of the uh, auto unions in the 1930s and uh, other people who kind of figure out, you know, like those workers who said, we have strength just by occupying our space. And uh, that meant occupying a factory. Other workers can't come and be strike breakers if you're sitting where you are. Right. So that principle of the sit down, in fact, if you go back to the early articles in 1960 on the sit ins, they're called sit down strikes. And uh, the, the sit in name really comes gradually uh, as the newspapers uh, kind of start following this movement that attracts thousands of students. And, and, uh, and really is the um, stimulus of the movement of the 1960s because the first, for the first time you have a movement that spreads throughout the South, at least in, uh, not into Mississippi and, and Alabama very much, but certainly in the, in the Upper South. Uh, it's, it spreads throughout that region and for the first time students are taking the initiative, young people. You know, in the Montgomery bus boycott, it was older adults who were the leading forces. But um, in 1960, then you have young people. And what's important to know is that King Gandhi's influence comes through King, but perhaps even more strongly comes through James Lawson, hmm. because he writes the statement of purpose of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Uh -huh. And uh, so when they come together, they actually respect jo um, uh, James Lawson more than Martin Luther King. Because yeah, he see. kind of represents their uh, framework of, of direct action, which they, they call it. Um, and uh, you know, so you have this you know, other force, which I think when you, we think about where some of us were, you know, that. You know, that's how I grew up. That was, that was the, they were the people who influenced me. And SNCC. You know. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, my first acquaintance in the movement was Stokely Carmichael, who was at that time a student at Howard University. And, uh, you know, I met him at a student conference in the summer of 1963, right before the March on Washington. And I remember that because I was thinking, you know, I had grown up in New Mexico, in Los Alamos of all places, huh. and uh, you know, so I was thinking the most radical thing I'd ever done in my life was to go to the March on Washington. And he was saying, why would you want to just go to there? Why don't you join us in Albany, Georgia? And, <laughs> you know, why don't you come to Cambridge, Maryland? And, and uh, you know, I, I found it hard to tell him that, you know, <laughs> Going to the march was about as radical as I could get at that point. Uh -huh. and, uh, um, but it, it did impress me that there were these people like Stokely. Um, a few months later, I met Bob Moses. And, um, that these were, these were people closer to my own age than Martin Luther King. He wasn't that old. He was only in his early 30s. But back then, over 30 um, but, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah there was that, that big... Yeah, uh, and, and I, I was part of that generation. And certainly there was that brashness uh, about the young people that appealed to me, my sense of adventure and, and uh, you know, that sense that we could... You know, I, I think from a certain point on, I saw King trying to catch up with us rather than, you know, that we were the vanguard he was trying to catch us, not the other way around. Yeah. Good things to remember now with, um, like with the, the climate change movement being led by young oh, yeah. people again. I, uh, I see that, that brashness uh, coming back. And, uh, you know, there's no such, you know, I hear a lot about passing the baton to a, no one passed the top. We grabbed the baton. We grabbed it, right? And it wasn't—it uh, wasn't a voluntary act of giving up the, 
you know, you know, we you made your own baton yeah, and right. marched on. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And uh, and I think that's the way it should be. I mean, I I don't think Greta is waiting for adults to tell her what to do. Clearly, she is not. Yeah. Clearly, she is not. So King came into the movement that had already embraced uh, Gandhi's principles of, of nonviolence. Yeah, and, and obviously when we're talking about Gandhian principles or Kingian principles, yeah, it, it's a complex matter. They're, they're adapting. And at a certain point, they become SNCC's principles. They become, you know, they, they're not really set in stone. I mean, what is a Gandhian principle? What is direct action? It could mean different things to different generations. Yeah, it's not like he wrote a guidebook or anything. I think what it really means is just a refusal to use violence, but on the other hand, to use aggressive means uh, to achieve your end. You know, I, I think most people who I knew described themselves as militants. Mm -hmm. Not in the sense that they would go out and get a gun, that came later, but uh, at that time, just um, you know, I, I went to LA and we I worked on in a group called the Nonviolent Action Committee, and um, and our our sense was to be as obnoxious and aggressive as you could be, and uh, it wasn't to be polite. Mm -hmm. It wasn't to to um, you know, our, our goal was different in, than in the South. It was much more about jobs, um, lesser degree housing, but mostly jobs. And our approach was, you know, if you're not hiring black people at, at your supermarket, we'll shut it down on a Friday night. Right. And, uh, you know, it, it got the message across and got people some jobs and, and it, it worked. And, and then on to the supermarket, it, the other end of town. And, and quite frankly, I don't know anyone who ever took a nonviolence workshop. Uh -huh. It was just pretty um, brash and, and the kind of thing that appeals to someone in their teens or early 20s, uh, when you're, especially when you don't have too many responsibilities and you don't worry about going to jail. And, uh, and that's the kind of, that was the kind of movement you know, I, I think that's one of the distinctions with, with Martin Luther King is that he was much, he was very cautious about going to jail, actually. Mm. And when you, when you look at his career, um, he was in a different situation. He had much more to lose. He had a family. He had, um, he was, uh, well, when he was arrested in, in Georgia in 1960, uh, you know, students kind of, the student movement in Atlanta they wanted to do a sit-in at one of the local department stores, and they wanted King to join them. And he was very reluctant. He didn't, he didn't want to, because he knew what was going to happen, that they were going to all get arrested. But they said, oh, we just want you to come and watch. <laughs> so they go uh, to this downtown department store and stay to sit in. And of course, King gets arrested. And they all go to jail. And all of them are, you know, bailed out, except for King, because he has a probation from a previous arrest. So he gets sent to Reedsville Prison. And he's not only that, but he's taken out of his cell in the middle of the night, put into a car guarded by a police dog, and taken, not ta told where he's being taken. As far as he knows, he's been take, taken off to be dumped in a river someplace. And he's taken to Reedsville Prison and because he had violated his, his probation. So one of the things he gets from that is that, uh, yeah, these kids, you know, they don't have any responsibilities. Uh, they're, they're probably going to get bailed out before too long, and they'll be back in their classes. Mm -hmm. I'm Martin Luther King. Something more dire is going to happen to me. And so he's always very, understandably, very cautious about uh, trying to choose when to be arrested and when not to be arrested, and when to come out and not to come out. And 
you know, those, those kinds of things. Um, for us, um, I mean, yeah, all of us are quite frightened when we um, go to jail. Um, I, I was one of these brash teenagers the first time I went to jail. And, um, and I realized I was going to stay in a cell with these criminals. <laughs> And you know, I was I was an innocent kid, and uh, and I literally did not want to go to sleep um, with uh, in in a cell with them, and I I felt very sheepish, uh, you know, because I, I called my my girlfriend, and you know, later became my wife, and said, "Would you try to bail me out?" <laughs> and she went around tried to get some money together. <laughs> But in the end, I fell asleep in the cell, and I woke up in the morning, and I hadn't been, you know, molested or anything. So, uh, so it all turned out well. And then I felt really kind of like, oh God, what a child you are. And um, yeah, so it's it, I can understand that sense of fear. But uh, but that was part of the divide of the 1960s. Yeah, it, it's not an easy thing to make that choice to to go yeah. to jail because. Everybody has visions of what it's like to be yeah. in jail. By the way, I, I noticed this this picture, which we chose as our. I, I um, stole it off your publicity. The basic yes. image, and um, some of you know that Bob Fitch, the photographer, of uh, who took that photograph, was King's personal photographer for the last three years of his life. Um, Bob Fitch passed away a couple of years ago. He lived in um, um, near um, Santa Cruz. And um, but he, all of his images, thousands of them, of King, have, have been purchased by Stanford. They're freely available. If you want to use this image for any nonprofit educational use, any of the other thousands of images, and not just King, uh, he also photographs Cesar Chavez and people like that. So. Um, Where can people access that? Is uh, it through just go, your website? Just or? go to the, well, you can go it through to our website, but the more direct way is the Bob Fitch Archive at Stanford. Uh, uh, again, Bob? The Bob Fitch Archive at Stanford. F-I-T-C-H. Yeah, F-I-T-C-H. And he was, uh, uh, he was very clear about that, that he wanted his images to be made available to the world, and which in, in our world is, you know, I, I'm always dealing with, copyright issues and you know all these restrictions on and so it's so wonderful to have yeah. uh, an image I'm like this. I'm glad to learn about that because I run into that too, and, designing and graphics. The interesting thing also about this image is that I met the granddaughter of the painter who did the Gandhi ah. um, image and it was given to King during his trip. Uh, he stayed in India in 1959 with Coretta and spent time um, going through the country, meeting with a number of, of Gandhians. And uh, so one of them gave him this, uh, uh, this portrait, in which he took back and put in his office. And so I, I met uh, the granddaughter of the, of the artist. Um, another thing about that is that uh, it's, uh, I, I have this, I went to the place, one of the places where King's visited uh, in Mumbai, and there was a woman there who had signed King into the museum, and in the in the, this place where Gandhi had his office in Mumbai. Um, so King had written his signature, and Greta had written his signature, and uh, that evening uh, he decided that he did not want to go back to the hotel. He wanted to stay in the room where Gandhi had, And he spent the night there. And uh, so the woman who signed me in had also signed in Martin Luther King. So I had the privilege of meeting, this is one of the two people I've ever met who knew both Gandhi and Martin Luther King. And the other one I just met more recently and he's still alive and, and, uh, and uh, um, um, at one of the Gandhi ashrams, and actually they were Gandhi's ash ashes are now, and Borda. And uh, he, he had 
the reason why he knew Gandhi is that as a teenager, he had told his father that he wanted to drop out of school and work with Gandhi. And his father had agreed to this and just said, you know, yeah, I guess you can learn a lot by just, uh, um, you know, probably more than you can learn in high school. So he agreed to let him go and work with Gandhi. So he did, and he, and he was um, part of some of Gandhi's last marches. Um, but he is still very, an, very much an active Gandhian. And so when King came in 1959, he met Martin Luther King. So those are the two people I know who, who knew both Gandhi and King. It was, you just mentioned 1959 is when yes. King went, and he was there for several weeks. and uh, Most of a month, yeah. Yeah, and Gandhi, of course, was no and longer if, with And if you want to know more about that trip, you can go into our website, but you can also go to Gan uh, Google Arts and Culture, and there's a, an exhibit of materials from King's trip to India in 1959, which we prepared. At Stanford? Uh, no, you're just, this is just on the web. If you, if you just go to Google Arts and Culture and look under the Martin Luther King exhibits, and uh, that's one of them. Let's talk about the conference. Yes. October 11th through 13th. Yes. So not too long, uh, less than two weeks now. Yeah, it's kind of the culmination of something that started about a dozen years ago. Is that when, right? When um, um, Prasad Galanopoulos, uh, a long time, a Gandhian uh, still lives in India, but he walked into my office and, and said he wanted to meet me and we started talking and he had been a professional who had res resigned his position to devote full time to uh, carrying out Gandhi's ideas. And so that's, that has been his life. And uh, so we started talking and uh, about our common ideas, and and he said, you know, Clay, it'd be really great if there's so many Gandhian organizations in India, so many people inspired by King's legacy in the United States. What if we could build a global network starting with those two groups of people? And uh, you know, it's well, you know, how do you do that? Right. <laughs> I have no idea. And uh, and he said, yeah, you know, look, you, you you know a lot of the people. You know the King family. You know all the, you know, you travel a lot and know all these people who do the King holiday and and uh, and you know, and I'm I'm kind of in the same position in, in India, um, coming together with. So we could do this, and um, and that uh, to make this long story short, um, we did a class together at Stanford on Gandhi and King in 1958 in the spring, and then I did uh, I proposed an overseas seminar, and Stanford agreed to to fund an overseas seminar. I took 15 students to India uh, in 2008. To study, uh, to study Gandhi. I did, went to, to a number of places, talked to a lot of the people. I did this with Linda Hess, who was then on the Stanford faculty. And, um, and as a result of that, then we, I realized that we were coming on 1959. And wouldn't it be nice to have something to mark the 50th anniversary of King's trip to India? And I, um, since part of my trip, not sponsored by Stanford, was sponsored by the State Department as a cultural exchange. So I talked at a number of Indian universities and, and then told the State Department, well, look, we need to do something official in the United States. And that it led to a congressional delegation, John Lewis, uh, uh, Andrew Young, Harris Wofford, you know, just all these people who had um, been associated with King and the movement. Um, some of them had had connections, like Harris Wofford had been to India many times. Uh, he was a former senator from, from uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, he was also one of the inspirations for the Peace Corps. 
um, under John Kennedy. Um, so all these people came in 1959, and we went to, again, a number of different places. And uh, so that became the beginning of, you know, I really expanded my horizons a great deal because I got to meet a lot of Indians when they would come over here. They would stop by the King Institute, and, and my relationship with Prasad developed. And um, so that's, that's how this conference really Interesting. So last spring in March, um, um, Prasad said, you know, look, let's have a conference. We've got the 150th anniversary of, of Gandhi coming up. Good time to do it. Good yeah. time to do it. And uh, so I called a meeting at Stanford, and I got uh, a number of people from all over the country uh, to come and pledge, let's do a conference, a major conference. And... Uh, I must admit that I was a little bit, um, you know, it was one of those things where I know what it costs to run a conference. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I knew it would be, you know, upwards of $100,000. It's actually going to end up more than that. Oh. <laughs> um, and, but, and at the time, I didn't have a cent of that. Um, but, um, you know, you, you, one thing I do know is I know a lot of people I can call on the phone, and and and, uh, and we've pulled together the funding, and a lot of it has come from Indian Americans who uh, want to see this happen, and uh, but from a lot of other people also, um, and uh, you know I hope that all of you come and and some of you at least pay the the uh, uh, the fee. <laughs> Uh, to to come, it's a hundred dollars, and the banquet is another hundred dollars, uh, and uh, we are hoping that uh, I'll at least break even. If not, I'll, I might be fired from my job <laughs> because because <laughs> I've got to pay the bills. And uh, but I, I think I, I am certain now that we are going to at least break even, and it's it's going to be fun. And and, and we, what can people expect there? Um, well, the first night, uh, we, you know, um, I mean, one of the first persons I called was Ila Gandhi, who I'd met once uh, about 10 years ago, and uh, she's the granddaughter of, of Gandhi, but she lives, she's a South African. She was very much involved in the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. So she has a whole independent, I don't think she's ever lived in India, really, um, but she's a, a wonderful person. I called her because I thought... It's kind of key to have somebody, an offspring of Gandhi. And I said, can I get you to come to Stanford? And you know, she said, yeah, I'm really interested in this, this idea. And I said, yeah, can I, you know, I want to pay your way and all this kind of stuff. And, and I thought, you know, gosh, what is a first class ticket from South Africa going to cost me? <laughs> and I said, I don't fly first class. You know, you all, a coach ticket is fine. And, you know, it was just the easiest. For me, as a person who's often asking people to come and talk, if every person I called <laughs> was that easy, um, and she was just wonderful, you know, and she, oh, uh, just give, I, you know, whatever accommodation you can arrange, you know, it's fine. And uh, so she was that type of person, and then Rajamon Gandhi, um, who was a historian, I'd met him before. I've met a number of people in the Gandhi um, family, and, and he's uh, written a wonderful biography of Gandhi, uh, probably one of the best that, that's out there right now. Uh, very, very honest about Gandhi's flaws and uh, doesn't paper over that at all. Um, and he's going to be here. Um, Martin Luther King uh, was you know, someone who I went to India with in 1959, uh, uh, no, 2009 to mark the 50th anniversary of his father's trip, so I got to know him, you know, both as president of the King Center, but also especially during that trip and get to know his family and his wife, Andrea, um, and then uh, the offspring of uh, Dolores Huerta. I was hoping to get Dolores Huerta. She unfortunately had committed to another event in Fresno, and uh, so she suggested her, her grandson. Um, uh, I think it's a grandson. I, I, I always mix up the one who is 
Cesar Chavez's granddaughter, and, and one of them is uh, her grandson. But they'll be here. So that'll be the first night. Um, and we'll have uh, some wonderful uh, people who I've done work with over, over the years. Uh, you know, I've done a play called Passages of Martin Luther King, which I've taken to China and taken to India. And so many of the people who have performed in, in uh, no, not to India, to the West Bank, uh, who have performed in, in Passages of Martin Luther King are, are going to be there. Um, just a, there'll be some surprises, of people who will be there. <laughs> Um, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, James Lawson, um, um, Mary King, who is uh, just a person who has uh, spent her life either in the movement in the South, but also studying Gandhi. She's written about uh, uh, Gandhi and King. Uh, yeah, just uh, I, I, going through, take the rest of the yeah, evening the, uh, to... The speaker's list here runs to two and a half pages. Yes, uh, and, and as I said, impressive. there will there will be more people who we can't even fit into, uh, you know, the the program. But they will be there and be available and be part of the discussion. I've told the moderators, look, sometimes there are going to be people in your audience who will know more than the people on your panel, mm -hmm. so you you have to get through the panel and open it up to the audience because there, I, I guarantee you there'll be people who will have a lot to say. All right. So uh, are, are there going to be workshops? You mentioned a very <laughs> important workshop earlier. Um, well, on the, oh, by the way, on, on Sunday there'll be a special event. Come to Stanford Church. It'll be an ecumenical service um, featuring Sister Helen Prejean. Uh, some of you know her as a leading anti-death penalty advocate. She has also visited the King Institute uh, in the past and just a wonderful person, another person who, oh, you know, yeah, I'm on a book tour, but where do you say, when do I have to be there? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's, it's been a pleasure to kind of get that kind of response uh, uh, from so many, so many people uh, who will um, try to be there. Um, some of you might be surprised. I went to George Schultz just recently. Uh, he, he, he will be there. Um, you know, there. There's so many people that you might be surprised. Uh, uh, you know, mention King, Gandhi, uh, they have special meaning. And, uh, and it's, it's wonderful. I think that Stanford should be honored to have such a distinguished group on its campus. Um, and, and go there to, even before the conference because we have put banners, we have put, uh, any of you have been there so far? I think you have. Yeah, uh, large, uh, Michael Colopy, uh, a photographer whose project is Architects of Peace, all the living win winners of the Nobel Peace Prize, big um, things. We'll have uh, Matt Heron, who photographed the Selma to Montgomery march, and uh, you know there'll be a long picture of that, and uh, on the opposite wall, the Salt March. Uh, large Good banner comparison. picture. Yeah. Large pictures of King and Gandhi. Um, it, it's. I'm I'm going to be impressed. <laughs> And I'm helping to put it up, so it's uh, and it's still going up. And we're we're working with uh, Mario Kyoto, a, a wonderful sculptor, uh, to to actually bring some of his sculpted pieces uh, to. And we're trying to fit, figure out how to fit them through the doors yeah. of uh, Tresider Union. It's going to be because <laughs> he says, "Don't don't break my sculpture," <laughs> and. Uh, so we're 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 going to have to work on that and try to try to do that on Friday and uh, uh, so it, there's just so many wonderful things that are um, a part of this and it just it it it's just amazing to me how many people have come forward and say look what can I do to help and do you feel like you're really laying the basis to uh, 
finally start this international I, 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 network? I, yes, and, and that's another aspect of it. Uh, we're here in Silicon Valley, and uh, some of you know that uh, the, the, the communications revolution that happened here, uh, back in the 90s, I would read all these manifestos about how wonderful this was going to be. It was going to bring the world together, bring world peace, and all that kind of stuff. Now we know that it brought the world together to sell all the information to people to make them <laughs> billionaires. But, um, but that promise is still there. Technology is neutral. That the, the notion that I can, every Friday, have a video conference and have people in different countries and different parts of the United States just talking to each other for free. I mean, no, we don't have to worry about the cost. You know, that, that is extraordinary. Yeah. And the, the notion that Facebook has two billion people uh, who participate in it, it it's, it's extraordinary. And what we need to do is use our influence. Don't fight it. It, it doesn't, it's kind of like the abolitionist movement saying, we're going we're gonna to fight modern transportation and communication. And... Uh, and publications, you know, they use the technology of their day to the limit. Mm -hmm. The movement of the 60s had the Watts line, you know, to all these kinds of things, which we thought was high tech, and it really was just a reduced rate for long distance. And, uh, you know, so all of these movements are going to use the technology of their day. And also, I think if we mobilize ourselves, we can leverage that power to go to Facebook, to go to Apple, to, to say, look, yes, we'll use your technology, but there's a deal to be made. That education should be freely available. Mm -hmm. Personal information should be never saleable. And if you, if you make the, you know, develop the notion that you can use this as a way of providing global information to people, um, but also assuring them that no one's going to sell their personal information. And all of that is part of human rights. I mean, the, one of the most basic human rights is the right to have privacy about your personal beliefs. The, the right to your own thoughts. The right to your own thoughts. And that is almost the most basic of all human rights. And what we need to do is, and we should have that ethos. I mean, you know, I, I wouldn't, if I had your personal telephone number and someone come up, came up to me and said, would you give it to me? The first thing I would do is ask your permission <laughs> before doing that. Yeah. So why, why does someone feel that it's okay to ever do that to anybody? to make money from their personal information. We, we need, part of changing the world is creating that kind of an ethos where that is just not acceptable. And anyone who makes money doing that, you know, I, I'll just end on this because it, it bothers me because I, I started out as a computer programmer um, before I was a historian. I went to. I'm glad you changed careers. <laughs> I, I went. I went to a. I was just waiting for the room to be available, so I, I, there was a really large class in Semex Auditorium on the Stanford campus, one of the largest auditoriums. Five hundred, six hundred people could sit in there. Semex Auditorium, in the business school. So I walk in, and it's a class on computer science. And that's why it had six hundred people in it. Um, you know, and. What was the first lecture of the first class? It was on data mining. <laughs> and the basic thrust of the class was there's lots of data out there. If you can learn how to use it and sell it, you can make a fortune. So that's what young people are being taught. <laughs> That that's their way to a quick fortune is and that to, it's perfectly okay. And, it, and it's perfectly okay. okay. It, yeah. It's like any other kind of mining, except that it's mining in 
the personal information of lots and lots of people. And uh, you know, so we need to obviously challenge that kind of an ethos where that is deemed legal. And not only that, we kind of admire it uh, for people who are very successful at it. So, uh, so that's part of it, is to, is, to, is to make it possible for global information, knowledge that we need to have, to flow downward to people who need that information. And education should be free. Next two weeks from now, I'm going to be at a conference. Education is a human right. But personal information as a human possession that belongs to the person and that our entire ethos has to be around that, our entire legal system has to be built based around that, or else we're not going to get anywhere. Um, and that's going to take some changes, and it's going to change the economy of Silicon Valley. Anyway, that's, yeah. that's my wrap. It's, it's all day. based on <coughs> advertising and, and selling us. We're, we're the exactly. product in, in uh, many ways. Yes. It's, as the class made clear, that is the most valuable thing in the world, information. I want to, we have maybe five minutes left here. I, I want to just explore a little about what else you hope to explore at this conference. And I, I, I just want to read a couple of lines from uh, your conference materials, because uh, this brings it up to date. You're, you're talking about modern communications, obviously, you're, this is not just a history conference. Yeah. This is the last. The last. Be, this last session will be. Where do we go from here? How do, How do we stay? That's connected? exactly what I wanted to ask you because you. And, that's and, the name. That yeah. was the name. Wasn't that Dr. King's last book? Well, was, where do we go? From where here? do we go yeah. from here? Right? And I think we'll always be asking that question. Where do we? What have we learned? And what can we? Um, how can we move beyond that? I think that. You know, one of the things about human rights is, and I'm teaching a course on it uh, actually every Wednesday, if any of you want to sit in on it, it's from civil rights to human rights. But one of the ironies of, of human rights is that it's often taught as, here was this idea that was kind of invented in Europe during the Enlightenment in, in Europe, and, and it, uh, it, you know, kind of crystallized in France and United States with the Declaration of Independence and the uh, Declaration of the Rights of Citizens, um, man and citizen in France, and the French Revolution, the American Revolution. And um, so I, 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 at the beginning of my class, I was just saying, what's wrong with this picture? And one of the things that's wrong with it is it leaves out Haiti, that Haiti came out of the same intellectual climate. It was, an, it was a revolution based around the concept of human rights, ending slavery. They actually did it and have been punished ever since by France and the United States, who repeatedly invaded Haiti and actually forced Haiti in order to gain recognition from the world to compensate the former slaveholders. And of course, Haiti had no financial ability to do that. That debt was not paid off until the 1940s. And so we're talking about how to make human rights viable in the 21st century. And we've, we've relied on the nation state to do that. When you think about that, that is so impossible. Um, I mean, you know, you, you think of the irony of the United States, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What is the only entity that can take away your life, deny you your liberty, and restrict your pursuit of happiness other than the nation? You know, that's the only entity that can has the legitimate right to take away your life. And so we're relying on that to protect our human rights. Uh, we have to have an alternative to that, and the only alternative is us. You know, that just as 
you had a couple of hundred wealthy white guys get into a room in, in Philadelphia and say, we declare a nation. And they had no power to do that. They were just, just doing it, just declaring it. And 200 years later, that was the most powerful nation on the face of the earth. So why can't we do that? Why can't we create a virtual nation that's just not dedicated around protecting borders, about building armies, about doing all the bad things that nations get to do? And it, it seems like that's the challenge of the 21st century, is to try to find some alternative ways of protecting human rights, of, of doing the things that nations like France and the United States set out to do 200 some years ago. And to but, take the but initiative. But failed miserable in doing it. And, and to take the initiative ourselves. And take and the initiative ourselves and to build into. To, to go back to where we started and we're almost out of time to yes. grab that baton and, yeah, and go exactly. on forward with exactly. it. My guest has been Dr. Clay Carson, Executive Director of the Martin Luther King Jr. Research and Education Institute at Stanford University. The Gandhi King Global Initiative Conference kicks off October 11th through the 13th. Check it out. Uh, register at kinginstitute.stanford.edu. And we'll Just see. Just remember the acronym GKGI. GKGI. You can search on that. That's how I get to it all the yeah. time. Dr. Carson, thank you so much for joining us on Other Voices. Thank you all for joining us here.